So let's talk through the full rules and points cost for the new big bad Tyranids about, how does the Norn Emissary shape up against the Norn Assimilator, and how good are they against the other monsters in the Tyranid Codex. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're doing a focus review on the Norn Emissary and the Norn Assimilator, perhaps the two biggest and most imposing miniatures out of the Tyranid range from the start of 10th edition. Games Workshop deciding to give Tyranid players a new centerpiece for their collections. In the video, we'll talk over the full rules and data sheet for the Norn Emissary and the Norn Assimilator, take a look at their damage output and durability against each other, other buffs and synergies, and how I most think about using them in game. As I'm sure most of you guys are aware of right now, these are fairly recent new Tyranid centerpiece miniatures, and their lore is that they're created by the hive mind as a sort of stress response to just try and solve one problem by sending their biggest, baddest organism after it. That problem might be a key individual that's marshalling the defences, or a massive war machine that the other monsters can't overcome. Send one of these things in, just break it asunder, and allow the rest of the swarms to continue doing what they do. In the lore from the Tyrannic Wars, they sent one after Lord Solaliontus, who was dispatched by Trajan Valoris in short order. My guess is that it probably wouldn't have ended well for Lord Solar if there hadn't been one of the galaxy's best fighters to step in for him though. The kit itself is quite a big one, it's £70, €90 Euros, or $115 from Games Workshop. A few people were kind of expecting it to be the size of a Tyranid Knight basically, though it's not quite that big. It's more sort of a very big hive tyrant, or maybe in the same sort of weight class as the Tyranifex maybe, though standing on its hind legs as opposed to on all fours. I think the price could be worse for Games Workshop as it goes, and you get around about 2.6 points per dollar out of it, which is definitely better than some of their kits. The main options out of the kit are the more psychic Norn Emissary on the left, or the more brutal melee focused Norn Assimilator on the right with some harpoons, and it comes perched on a great big bit of Tyranid terrain. Seems like this thing gets his tactical rock of his own. In general, I think the miniature's gone down really quite well with Tyranid fans, and I think it's fairly nicely executed and balanced. At time of recording, these things haven't been on pre-order for too long. If you were looking to pick them up a little bit cheaper, Element Games in the UK stocks them for 20% off, so that's around about £55. And for those of you down under, Gap Games in Australia usually has the New Games Workshop pre-orders for 20% off, and both of those are links down in the video description if you were thinking about picking up one of these anyway. Any purchases made through those links do help support the channel, though obviously I only pick one up if you really wanted one in the first place. Let's get into the rules though in the new Tyranids Codex, and the Norn Emissary is 285 points. This makes it into one of the most expensive Tyranids units that you can field right now. I think it actually adds up to being the most expensive in the Codex outside of Forge World by the Assimilator. Its stat line is fairly meaty, it moves 10 inches so it's fairly fast, Toughness 11, a 2 plus save with a 4 plus invulnerable save, I guess it gets that due to being kind of like a zone throw I guess. It's got 16 wounds, a leadership of 7, and objective control of 5. Generally quite a good start there, and a pretty intimidating stat line. I feel like the invulnerable save makes it a lot harder to kill with dedicated anti-tank weapons, as we'll see with some durability comparisons in a second. It also gets a special rule that adds to its toughness, which gets a 4 plus feel no pain type save against mortal wounds, they're very, very relevant in 10th edition. Lots of things with devastating wounds are going to struggle to focus down this guy anywhere near as easily. Keywords wise, it is a Psyker and gets the Synapse keyword, which is kind of handy for giving it to other bogs that are advancing up the board. It isn't a character, so I guess it maybe falls into a similar sort of class to the Maliceptor, being a Psyker and Synapse, but not character. And if the enemy does manage to take this thing down, it's got Deadly Demise D6, a fair chance to blow up either in the enemy's midst or in yours. Could be interesting in the Crusher Stampede, as there's a stratagem to allow you to do that automatically. Damage wise, the Norn Emissary is the one that's more focused on durability than damage. Its attacks are fairly powerful, but not quite as overall a massive threat as the Assimilator. For its shooting attack, it does get a fairly flexible Psychic Tendril shot. You either get to choose Neuroparasite, Neuroblast, or Neuro Lance. That's essentially the choice between a Precision Sniping attack for Strength 8 and Damage D3. A 2d6 shot attack with strength 6, AP minus 2 and damage 1. That one will be quite good at clearing out hordes. Or perhaps the most exciting one in my opinion, the Neuralands. Two shots hitting on a 2 plus at strength 12, AP 3 and damage d6 with melter 2 if you get within 9 inches. I feel like that one probably gives you the most bang for your buck if you get a target within range. I think it is nice to have the flexibility though. Neuroparasite could sometimes be the right choice to put the last few wounds on a key character. 
and the option to be more flexible and clear some hordes if you need to never really goes amiss. I would bear in mind that these do all have the psychic keyword though, which can be a negative sometimes, some things get feel no pain type saves against psychic attacks, and bear in mind that the Norn and Misery will also have the psychic keyword as well, and that does mean that certain weapons kill it a bit easier. Besides its psychic shooting attack, it also gets some pretty beefy melee, as you'd expect. As mentioned, it's not really quite on the same sort of level as the Assimilator, but you basically get 10 attacks that hit really quite hard. It hits on two of them, and it gets six with its bigger claws at strength 9, AP 2, and damage 3, so quite good in general purpose there. And then an extra set of four attacks with its secondary talons, hitting it at strength 7, AP 2, and damage 2, so going to be a bit more effective against medium infantry there. Between that, that's a fair bit of attacks and multi-damage and varying profiles, should be good against most things. Anything toughness 10 or higher though is going to give it a pause as you'd be wounding on 5s. Finally, we've got the main special rule for both the Emissary and the Assimilator, which is singular purpose. This one feels quite fluffy as per the lore that they told us for it. Basically, at the start of the game, you get to choose either an objective or an enemy unit, and you get a big buff to either claiming that objective or taking down the enemy unit that you've picked. If you're on the objective, then if you're within range of it, you get a 5 plus fill no pain type save, which is a fairly monumental durability increase, and also objective control 15. Unless your opponent can swarm it with a horde of high objective control models, then that objective is basically yours. Otherwise though, if you choose the enemy units, then you get a big damage boost against it, you get 4 rerolls to hit and wound against that target. Really quite a massive damage buff, and occasionally I do still think that that might be the right choice over the objective. If the opponent's got a powerful but slow moving unit that he doesn't want you to get the jump on, then it might really limit his options. Though I feel like the feel no pain and the objective control 15 is probably going to be the go-to for most lists playing competitively. It just perhaps feels a little bit more reliable to come off, and particularly with a fairly enormous model that you're going to struggle to hide easily, that 5 plus feel no pain durability will be appreciated. Moving on to its counterpart though, the Norn Assimilator is a little bit more expensive at 305 points. This one's basically slanted more towards melee damage and hitting the enemy very hard, but not being quite as durable. It does get the same sort of stat line as the Emissary. The same toughness 11, 2 plus save and 16 wounds, kind of similar to a Turvagon. But this one lacks the 4 plus invulnerable save and the feel no pain against mortal wounds. So that basically means it'll be kind of similar toughness against things that have low AP or kind of medium AP if you can get cover on it, but anything with say Melter with AP 4 or better, or Mortal Wound attacks with Devastating Wounds, the Norn Emissary is going to be significantly tougher. This one's also not a Psycho, which is probably a positive if anything, it gets Synapse but not the Psycho keyword, so it won't be affected by anti-Psycho weapons. When dealing damage, the Assimilator is definitely a fair bit more focused towards combat than it is at range. Its range shooting attack is a little bit closer range with its Tox Injector Harpoon. It looks like it does just get the one profile at this one that you can see here, that represents both of the harpoons on the model. You get two shots hitting on a 2+, strength 12, AP 3 and damage D6 plus 1, kind of las cannon type profile. But then if you do manage to hit a monster or vehicle with it, then you get a plus 2 to charge in the charge phase that follows. So as well as just damaging the vehicle then and there, it also gives you extra chance of getting all that lovely melee damage in. It's definitely not going to be quite as flexible at range though, this one's shorter range and you don't have the anti-horde or precision options. When you do to get to combat, the Assimilator is a lot better at dealing with really tough stuff. First up you get the same 6 attacks as the Emissary does, 6 attacks at strength 9, AP 2 and damage 3. Though on this guy, rather than being the main event, these attacks are perhaps the less exciting one. You also basically get the same sort of Tox Injector Harpoon attacks in melee as well. 4 attacks hitting on a 2 plus at strength 12, AP 3 and damage D6 plus 1. Having a weapon that's got really quite big damage and can wound say toughness 10 and 11 vehicles on a 3 plus is really quite a big deal. It means the assimilator is a far bigger threat to any sort of medium armour compared with the emissary. Finally for special rules, the assimilator also gets that same special rule with the singular purpose, either picking an objective or picking an enemy unit for rerolls. Compared with the Emissary though, you get to trade out that 4 plus feel no pain against mortal wounds for harpoon barbs. This one's basically punishment for falling back against the Norn Assimilator. Once per turn, a unit that falls back takes d6 mortal wounds on a 2 plus if they fall back away from the Assimilator, which does seem like really quite a nice deal. Most of the time that's going to be exactly the sort of model that you're really not going to want to remain in combat with, otherwise it could just absolutely kill you in the ensuing fight phase. 
but at the same time, if the opponent does choose to fall back, then they could be risking an awful lot of damage. If you lock out and roll high with that thing, then you could wipe out an entire unit. Overall, I feel like they both seem interesting. The Norn Emissary gets you the big defence, the Norn Assimilator gets you the big damage, though it does cost a little bit more in points. Comparing the numbers of the two models side by side, first up, here's their damage output. This is roughly what you'd expect on average turn on turn for one shooting phase followed by a fight phase when the emissary or the assimilator is charging into the fight. I weighted these numbers to both be 285 points worth of models, so taking a little bit off the assimilator just for comparison, but it still does absolutely fine. For damage output, the emissary does considerably better against the termagants, having the option for an anti-infantry type psychic shooting attack, kind of similar against the intercessors where its melee is pretty similar to the assimilators. But then against all the other targets, the assimilator is fairly notably better. It kills on average four terminators rather than the three of the emissary. And then it's quite a lot better against the rhino tank and lamb raiders. And around about double the damage output against the big toughness 12 target. It's definitely going to be a lot better in some matchups with heavy vehicles on the other side of the table. These are all without rerolls as well. If you got to attack your chosen prey targets, all of these numbers will get a bit bigger if you weren't using the objective thing. On the other side, here's the per point durability, the amount of hits that you need to kill one of these beasties, and again, I've wasted it down to 285 points worth of models, so again, the assimilators lost around about 7% here. For things like heavy bolters and auto cannons, they essentially have the same durability. The only difference is the points cost, which is the reason the emissary is slightly ahead there. But then for the rest of the profiles, the 4 plus invulnerable comes into play, or the emissary's mortal wound protection. The emissary is slightly ahead against the last cannons as it saves on a 4 plus rather than a 5, really quite significantly far ahead against melter weapons with AP minus 4, and just slightly over double durability if the assimilator can't get a 5 plus feel no pain for being on an objective against them, though it catches up quite a lot if you can. Overall, they're pretty similar efficiency against small arms with AP minus 1 or 2. The emissary gets significantly better against high AP things or mortal wounds. Otherwise, besides the base data sheet, other things that could help in Codex Tyranids is the Synapse rule. This guy gets Synapse in himself, as well as a leadership of 7, so that usually means that you're just not going to fail leadership on objectives at a key moment. Really quite a big deal if you're holding it with a big 15 objective control points there. Plus it will be a draw to have them in the front ranks as well, alongside other things moving up, like maybe Haraspexes or Tyranifexes. You could provide the Synapse buff to those units as well. Otherwise, for units in the Codex, I feel like the Hive Tyrant on foot might be reasonable to pair with them. They're a particularly good target for his free stratagem each turn, so you could use, say, the 5 plus fill no pain type stratagem if you're playing Invasion Fleet. That could be used to keep them safe before they get up towards the objectives if you're using the fill no pain one. Otherwise, the Psychophage could give you a 6 plus fill no pain, again for the early turns, maybe not quite as impactful for the points spent though. And Venom Throats could potentially give you the benefit of cover, I feel like with quite big models with bases and things, you could often just hide at least a small part of it behind a ruin. I generally try and do that if you possibly can when you're moving up, as that's going to make a huge difference with a 2 plus save on the go. I kind of feel like none of these are particularly essential though. They seem like they're a unit that does what they do really quite well independently, and are perhaps better at helping out other units by providing synapse than really needing extra buffs themselves. Finally, for more generic stuff, I suppose you could put them in strategic reserve if you really wanted to. Theoretically, you could get a non assimilator, a 7 inch charge against monsters and vehicles with those toxin injector harpoons. Feels like it maybe could be a bit of a gimmick though, though it could be alright against an army like Imperial Knight. Jump on one of them out of nowhere, as you're probably going to have at least one viable target somewhere. In general, though, I feel like it's probably going to be better off to start them on the board, as they're mainly melee units. And if the opponent doesn't have vehicles or monsters right on the flanks, then you're probably just going to turn up and fail a 9 inch charge. For detachment specific stuff, I feel like 4 out of the 6 high fleets are kind of relevant for these guys. The standard invasion fleet remains pretty good, and I feel like they use the primary buff pretty well for extra damage. Lethal hits against monsters and vehicles, or sustained hits against infantry and swarms are both quite nice. The 1 CP for the 5 plus feel no pain I think could be very worth it on these guys if they're not within range of an objective already. And anything with an absolutely enormous points value could be alright to redeploy with alien cunning if the opponent was about to get the alpha strike on them. Could leave your opponent guessing where exactly they're going to go until quite late on. For Crusher Stampede, they definitely have access to a lot of monster related stratagems. The core buff is maybe a bit lackluster on them though, as they already hit on twos. So if they're just damaged slightly but not below half strength, they won't get anything from it. 
I suppose at least with a big tough monster with a bunch of wounds though, they might be on a low number of wounds left before actually being killed and have a bit more chance of that happening than some monsters out there. There's a fair few stratagems that seem like they could be good situationally on them. I feel like maybe the one command point for automatic deadly demise might be one of my favourites. If you know that they're on their last legs, then you could charge them into their doom and potentially put d6 mortal wounds on a whole bunch of enemy units for one CP. That could be very, very efficient. Otherwise, for the Assimilation Swarm, they seem like a pretty optimal unit to have holding down a midfield objective alongside some Harvester organisms. Seems like you could pair them quite well with the Harrispex. They provide Synapse to the Harrispex, and the Harrispex provides healing to the non Assimilator or Emissary. And there's a few stratagem options that could also allow you to heal them there. I've got a one command point lethal hits melee thing as well, which could be handy enough for the Emissary if it was engaging something big and tough. Finally, being perhaps some of the most threatening and massive synapse creatures around, they're definitely relevant in the synaptic nexus detachment. I do feel like they have perhaps slightly limited use for the detachment buffs though. Again, they already hit on twos in melee. The 5 plus invulnerable save is often not going to be relevant with that 2 plus save, and certainly not for the emissary that gets a 4 plus anyway. But again, they're kind of handy for just providing the synapse network to other units, I suppose. Perhaps one of the best things for this detachment though is the irresistible will stratagem that you could use. One command point for reroll ones to hit and wound in melee. This one looks like it's efficient enough just to use on the non emissary or non assimilator by itself, never mind if you are actually supporting other units in combat nearby. For a reactive defensive one, you could also worsen enemy AP by one when they're attacked, means that you could potentially be saving on a 3 plus against an AP minus 3 attack between that and cover. Between these ones, I feel like the Invasion Fleet and the Synaptic Nexus probably do the most for them. I feel like they're really going to be a terrible choice in most armies though, just with the enormous defence and damage they can get. Overall, I generally feel like both of these models are in a pretty good place if you do want to put them on the table. Probably not so good that they're going to be absolutely standouts and also include in every single list I suspect. They seem at least somewhat well balanced against each other and other Tyranid monsters depending on what you want out of a list. You could have more damage with the Assimilator which could take on really heavy targets like Knights or Toughness 11 or 12 vehicles. Or more durability out of the Emissary with its protection against mortal wounds and invulnerable save and being a bit cheaper. My guess is that probably the Emissary might see a little bit more play than the Assimilator though I suppose we'll wait and see. The enormous defensive profile alongside the feel no pain and objective control 15 just looks like it's a pretty good shortcut to getting you a whole bunch of points on the board and really quite a good anvil unit to have your opponent dash all their firepower against while still generally being very threatening to heavy or medium infantry. I suspect that the normal game plan for these guys will be to advance up towards that midfield objective trying to keep toes of the model behind ruins to get it cover with that big 2 plus save as it goes and then dare your opponents to come within charge range of it to try and take the objective off them and risk a whole bunch of damage. I suppose against some armies that have got slow moving really big tanky threats that you absolutely need to kill you could well flex out to the damage rerolls option. Might be worthwhile against something like Imperial Knights or Custodes and then your opponent would have to be very wary about approaching your big emissary or assimilator. Against a lot of armies though that's not going to be quite as relevant if they've got lots of fast moving things that don't really quite warrant the big attention. For the raw numbers I will be interested to see how it competes in competitive lists. I feel like it's interesting enough at first glance against things like the Harrispex, Maliceptor or Tyran effects. Perhaps some of the bogs that are most likely to be stomping their way into the midfield normally. All of those already good bogs did get a little bit cheaper in the new codex as well though. So it's still going to be pretty interesting. In general though at their points cost I feel like they seem usable enough. I've no doubt that we'll see people experimenting them in competitive lists. In any case though let me know your thoughts on the data sheets down in the comments below. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas and which one of the two you think is better. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics or I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. Hopefully the next one out shall be a full review of the Tyranids Codex. Finally if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel and you'd like to help keep them coming I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.